Our text for meditation this morning is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20, verses 9 to 19. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one they also beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, May this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and said, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. This is the word of our God. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from he who is and who was and who is to come. Amen. Dear fellow believers in Christ, as you notice, we decided to uh, not do the stage. Now I have a bigger area to roam in, and it's not as big of a worry that I'll go a tumbling down in my little spot. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the year is 1862. It is during the Civil War. In a town called Fredericksburg, Virginia, there was a very major battle, the Battle of Fredericksburg. And during this battle, something astounding happened. So the Confederate Army, during the battle, they got a defensive position at what's called Mary's Heights. So it was the perfect defensive position. The hill was behind them, and there was this long stone wall. So they all just set up on the wall with the hill behind them. And in front of them was a huge open field, barely any trees. Perfect defensive position. And the Union Army facing them was commanded by General Ambrose Burnside, from whom, by the way, we get the nickname Sidebirds because of his facial hair, a little tidbit for you. He, when he saw the Confederate position, ordered the Union Army to charge, to attack it. And it failed. It was a disaster. Guys got blown apart. So he ordered them to charge it again. And it failed again. And then he ordered them to charge it again. And it failed again. So he ordered them to charge it again, and it failed again. And then, guess what he did? Never going to believe this. He ordered them to charge it again. And it failed again. It got so bad that the Confederate army actually started clapping. Like, not mocking them. They were actually... Clapping. They, they couldn't believe the bravery of these Union soldiers who were walking straight to their death. In fact, Robert E. Lee, the general of the Confederate Army, even he was almost moved to tears. He couldn't believe that the, that the Union Army kept going in there. And what did General Burnside do? He sent in another attack. And then he sent in another one. And another one. By the end of the day, the Union Army had charged them 14 times, and every single one had failed. Over 8,000 Union soldiers were dead or wounded. 
Now you look at that, and it's, it's one of the most boneheaded maneuvers in history. Like if it didn't work the first five times, then why would it work now? Why are you still sending guys in there? You know what's going to happen. I mean, it's ludicrous that he did that 14 times. Brothers and sisters, I bring this up this morning because in our parable, the owner of the vineyard does something very similar. He keeps sending servants in there. And as you read it, you know what's going to happen. You know the outcome, but he keeps sending them in. And then finally, he sends his own son who gets killed. It's ludicrous. It's ridiculous. It's stubborn. But it needs to be. Because, brothers and sisters, this shows us about our Father's love. For, for us to be forgiven, us sinners, for us to be brought back to our Father so that we could be one with Him, we needed a special kind of love. A relentless love. A love that kept charging and charging and stubbornly kept charging. And only the love of of God fits that bill. Only the love of our Father in Heaven fits that bill. Now as we start to look at our text today, we're going to do something different. We're going to start at the end, at the end of the parable, because there is something unique about this parable. Listen as I read verse, half of verse 16 and then verse 19. Now, in verse 16, Jesus just finished saying the parable, and he didn't explain it. And this is what the people say. When the people heard this, they said, May this never be. And then in verse 19, The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. So, dear friends, what does this tell you? When Jesus told this parable, and this was during Holy Week in Jerusalem, he's going to die at the end of the week, that's when Jesus tells this. When he told the parable, everybody understood it. Everyone listening to it understood what he was talking about. That's very unique. In fact, if you look through the Gospels, most of the time when Jesus taught in parables, most of the people didn't understand it all. They didn't really get it. In fact, in the Gospel of Mark, Mark quotes Isaiah and says that Jesus taught in parables so that the people would be ever hearing but never understanding. Or think about how many times Jesus would have to take the disciples aside and then explain the parable he just told because they didn't get it, like with the parable of the sower. Brothers and sisters, most of Jesus' ministry, when he told a parable, most of the people didn't get it. They usually didn't get it. And yet here, everyone in the audience, believer, unbeliever, simpleton, chief priest, everybody immediately knew exactly what he was talking about. They knew what he meant in the parable right away. That's one of the only times, if not the only time, that that happened in the Gospels. In fact, the chief priests understand the, par the parable so well that they immediately want to arrest him and kill him. Now, why? Well, dear friends, Jesus was not being overly nice in this parable. Now, I'm not going to reread the whole thing. You know what happens. The man has the vineyard, hires the tenants. He sends his servants and then his son. They kill the son, and Jesus ends it all by saying that the man will kill those tenants. Of his vineyard. Now, if you're wondering why did the people understand this parable so quickly, why did they pick up on it so fast? 
Well, it's because Jesus was being very deliberate here. That picture of a vineyard that was all throughout the Old Testament. God had used that picture many, many times to talk about Israel. Israel as a vineyard. And most of the time that God used it, it was negative. It was a negative picture. So Jeremiah chapter 2, Psalm 80, Isaiah chapter 5, those are all spots where God would use the picture of a vineyard to talk about Israel. And it was almost always negative. Like in Isaiah chapter 5, God says, I came, I planted a vineyard, and I looked for fruit, and I didn't find any. That's you, Israel. So when Jesus is in front of the Jews on Jerusalem, or in Jerusalem during Holy Week, and he starts out his parable by saying, a man planted a vineyard and looked for fruit on it, Everybody in the audience went, he's talking about Israel. He's talking about us. They knew that picture. In fact, they knew that when Jesus said the tenants were not going to give the fruit that they were beating the servants, they knew he was talking about the chief priests the ones in charge of the vineyard. In fact, it seems that the people even knew that when Jesus said the son of the owner, he was talking about himself. They understood the parable, and they understood that Jesus was directly calling out the chief priests and the teachers of the law because they had mistreated the vineyard. And so his words of warning, the Lord is going to come and put an end to them. Everybody caught that. That is why the chief priests and the teachers of the law wanted to kill him. Right then and there. It's ironic, isn't it? In the parable, Jesus warns them, do not try and kill the son. And what does that make them want to do in our last verse? Kill the son. And it's because they liked their position. They liked their authority. They liked their religion. They liked the temporary, and they didn't want the change that the Messiah was bringing. It was their vineyard. Now, brothers and sisters, as we look at this parable, I know that I am talking to the people of God, people born of water and the Spirit. You know your Savior. You love your Savior. And that is a gift of our God. So I'm not going to stand here and say, you know, you guys are just like the tenants. You want to kill the Son. That's not true. You know your Savior and you love your Savior. And yet... There is something about the tenants in this parable that very much resonates with us. There is something here that clings to our heart. Think about it this way. In the parable, why did the owner give the vineyard to the tenants? So that they could sit there all day and just have fun and grow fat on the grapes and just have pleasure the whole time? No. He gave them the vineyard. He rented it out to them so that they could be productive and responsible and give him some of the first fruits. That was the whole point. So, let me ask you this. Why does God give you time? Why does he give you a day off? Why does he give you money? Why does he give you 30 different stores to buy clothes from? You just get to choose. Why does he give you how many different channels on TV? Why does he give you smartphones so you can go onto thousands of different websites? Why does he give you all this? 
Why does he give you the ability to listen to 7,000 different kinds of music? And by the way, that's a low estimate. It's like hundreds of thousands. We can listen to whatever we want. Why does he give us all of this? So that we can grow fat with pleasure? So we can just enjoy 24-7 enjoy entertainment? Why does he do it? He gives us these things so that we can be productive and responsible Christians who give back the first fruits to him. And if you're wondering, how am I going to give back first fruits to listening to a piece of music? It's simple. It's the way you look at your things. It's all his. And he gives it freely to you. But the problem is we all have a sinful heart that wants us to look at these things as if they're ours, as if the temporary is what's important. This is my kingdom. This is what I want, just this stuff. And the truth of the matter is that in our sin, every single one of us has abused Every single gift God ever gave us. We as sinners are absolutely guilty of that. Of being just like the tenants, this is my vineyard, my inheritance. What else is that but to act like the tenants? This is all mine. And that's a lot of guilt. That's a lot of sin. I mean, if you really sit down and look at it, and all the things in your life, that's a lot of sin, and that's a lot of guilt, and it's all ours, and we can't cover it. And in order to cover all that guilt, and to cover all that sin, you're going to need a love, a certain kind of love. You're going to need a relentless love. A love that keeps going and going, that keeps charging and charging. A love willing to give up his one and only son. And in case you haven't guessed it, only the love of our God in heaven fits that bill. Only the love of our God in heaven can save us. A love that kept charging and charging throughout thousands of years of history, from Abraham to David, throughout the history of Israel and the Israelites, they would keep sinning against him, and then his love would charge again. And then they would turn away from him, and his love would charge again. And then they would purposely turn their backs on him, and his love would charge again. Over and over again. His love for sinful people kept charging and charging until the perfect sacrifice was offered. And the one and only Son was dying on a cross until the perfect blood was shed. Shed for you to cover you from all your sins. And now, brothers and sisters, you who have been redeemed by that perfect blood of the perfect sacrifice, now, throughout your life, every time you fall back into sin, every time you turn yourself away from God, every time you abuse the things he gives you, his love keeps charging over and over again. He charges at you and charges at you a love that is stubborn and won't be stopped. Constantly reminding you that you are forgiven. You are righteous. A child of God. A relentless love that keeps charging and charging and won't stop. Finally, brothers and sisters, they all understood the parable. They all knew what Jesus was talking about. But the wicked tenants are not the most important part of that parable. The relentless love of God is. The love of God for us sinners that just would not stop. It kept charging and charging and charging and still does. Only the love of our God fits that bill. Amen.